G'day ZKD here and welcome to chapter 6 of the Path of Exile Survival Guide. In this episode we set our hands on fire, do some heart surgery, and explore the chambers of sin and weaving. Alrighty guys, welcome back. In this episode we're going to be going into the Chamber of Sin's Lightning Field Dungeon. We're going to be visiting some giant spoopy spiders and we're going to be clearing out the Western Forest. Now the Chamber of Sins side of the map and the Western Forest slash Weaver's Chambers side of the map over here are pretty similar levels. Um, so you kind of have free choice of which direction you go first. I usually make the decision based on the following thing, whether I have good lightning resistance available or not. Now Chamber of Sins is primarily a lightning filled zone, there are a lot of spark casters that shoot lightning bolts at you and things like that, and uh, you want good lightning resist on your character. In the lower difficulties here you can kind of get by with pretty low resists in all of these zones in Act 1 and 2, but um, in later difficulties you definitely want to uh, consider that lightning resist strongly. Nonetheless we'll keep in good practice of these sorts of things and look at our resistances. I notice here that my lightning resistance is only 6%, so there's a few things we can do. The simplest thing is to just swap out a one of our rings, one of our random rings, so I have a life ring here, for a lightning resistance ring. So this gives me a good like 40 something, uh, 40 or so uh, lightning resistance there, which is more than enough. Anything over like 40 at this point is going to be perfect for moving through this zone. So as simple as that. Now we do lose 30 HP obviously, but um, that amount of lightning resist makes a much bigger difference than that amount of lost HP. Resistances in Path of Exile make a huge difference to the damage you take. So before I continue on, I'm actually going to stop in at Nessa at Act 1 and pick myself up another support gem. And this is something I recommend to you guys to always be on the lookout for. Always be on the lookout for gear that has good sockets for you to be able to potentially link up your skills and empower them further with additional support gems. So there's no reason why we only have to have our sweep link to added fire and life gain on hit. If we have the sockets, why not improve our single target as well? Well, so we have Molten Strike here, and I have a red socket next to this already available without needing to change any gear. I have a red socket open that's currently doing nothing, so basically I can chuck myself, uh, pick myself up an added fire, which costs me all of one orb of transmutation, not very expensive whatsoever, and with that I can improve my damage a great deal. We can go for 343 DPS up to 430 DPS, so a big improvement in damage just just for spending a tiny little bit of currency and just keeping an eye out for those good links. And you know, later if I happen to see something that's got another red socket on it, three red sockets, then I can pick up a life gain on hit and have better survivability against single targets. So always be on the lookout for chances to improve the links on your gear. So now that our lightning resistance is sorted, we're going to take the waypoint here to the crossroads. And we're going to head up towards the northwestern side of this crossroads just here to go to Chamber of Sins. Now the road will eventually break off up here and you'll start running into some sort of cliff faces. Uh, you'll be able to find eventually just along this side, it's pretty much straight in line with the road, there'll be kind of like an upwards ramp here that leads further up. Now there is always a unique mob here, Calaf Headstaver. Now Calaf is basically a gigantic behemoth of a bandit man and uh, he uses heavy strike. Pretty simple stuff, he just hits pretty hard. Uh, at this point we have plenty of res plenty of survivability to be able to deal with him. We can use our powerful single target there to take him out. No problems whatsoever, nice and easy stuff. He's, he's a pretty easy guy to deal with, just uh, be aware that heavy strike can hit uh, pretty hard at times. Here we have another strong box, I'm going to give that an identifier just so we know what's coming with that one. Identified items, a stream of monsters, easy peasy, we'll open that up and uh, take out these monsters as they appear and get any loot we get from the lockbox. Remembering to pick up any superior greater life flasks and if you don't have any lightning resist rings keep an eye out for any topaz rings that drop. It's not actually a bad idea to equip dual topaz rings if you have not a very good ring here like this one here is not particularly good just adds a little tiny bit of damage so I could quite easily take this topaz on and substitute that in as well to be able to basically uh, get my lightning resist pretty close to cap so pretty easy. I'm doing fine for survivability though so I'll keep my iron ring for now. Keep heading upwards, you'll go up two ramps and then you'll eventually find yourself at the entrance of the Chamber of Sins level 1. Chamber of Sins is a gigantic square location with a unique boss in the middle of the map. In each of the four corners of the map there'll be these kind of corner rooms with some staircases in them. In three of those corner rooms there'll be a pack of champion mobs, so blue monsters which give additional experience and loot. And uh, this actually makes this zone a really nice place to farm to get a few levels if you're feeling a little bit weak. And then the, uh, the fourth one that doesn't have that blue pack there will instead have the stairs down to Chamber of Sins level 2. So the easiest and safest thing to do in this zone is to simply stick to one of the outside walls and you'll eventually uh, walk your way through each of the different uh, corner rooms 
and uh, eventually find the one that leads downstairs. Now there are a lot of blockages in this, so if you encounter one of these, there's not much you can do but backtrack and find another route through. So uh, since we encountered that right at the start here, it's not a bad idea for us to just sort of take this outside wall around the left instead and follow that all the way out there. Now you're mostly going to be encountering a bunch of skeletons and zombies and necromancers in here, a couple spiders as well, nothing too nasty that uh, you haven't really dealt with before. The thing to watch out for though is that the zombies when they die in this zone do unleash a cloud of poison, uh, poisonous gas essentially which does uh, a good amount of chaos damage if you stand in the location. Here's one of those corner rooms, you can see the staircase down there and the guaranteed champion pack just here which can give us a bit of extra experience. So with those zombies, just watch out as you kill a big pack of them, try not to stand on top of the corpses, try and move just after killing them, and you'll avoid the majority of that damage. For my passive tree progression, now that we've hit resolute technique and are guaranteed to hit enemies, we have a couple of choices. We could go up into the Templar area of the tree, which would give us a good amount of life, as well as some area of effect, making us hit more monsters with our attacks. Otherwise, we can go down into Duelist, which is a good combination of life, damage, and attack speed. I'm going to go down into the Duelist section first, and I'm going to head through this Life Node and Warrior's Blood, and then we have a bit of travelling to do. In general, as you're navigating through the tree, whatever build you're playing, the way I like to do it in terms of levelling is to think of it in terms of travelling for like a vacation or a trip or something like that. Uh, what do you do before you set out for like an 8 hour drive, right? You stop and get some supplies first, you'll, you'll, get some, uh, you'll get some food and things for your journey. So it's a good idea before you make like a long trip, like let's say I have to do a whole bunch of travelling nodes here, or maybe I have to go all the way around the outside of the tree or I'm heading all the way through the middle like that. It's a really good idea to first make sure that you've gotten a good amount of life recently. So we have this life cluster here and we have this life cluster here. We already have a good amount of life for the relatively few points that we've spent. So we're going to be okay and going to have decent survivability for the rest of this trip until we get into Duelist where we're going to be getting some more life right at the end there. So we kind of our supplies will last until we make it to our destination. Now if you do happen to stray too far from the outside track and wander into the middle of the zone, you will find this, and this is pretty easy to recognise, this giant circular room in the middle. Now some of the entrances into this will be blocked off and there'll be some spiders and things like that in here. And then there is a particularly nasty unique boss here, Black Death. Now this guy uses Viper Strike which when it hits you has a chance of applying a damage over time effect, you can see that stacked up there. And when that happens the AI of the monster makes them more inclined to do more and more Viper stri Strikes. And what happens is that that'll keep stacking up and you'll take more and more damage over time from that. Now again we're pretty you know we're kind of over leveled for the zone we're feeling particularly tough at the moment but you can see how nasty those viper strikes are. That's me using a, a life flask right there and I'm not even really able to out heal the chaos damage like it's just basically consuming my life flask effect. So the best thing to do is if you get a couple of viper strike stacks back off let your healing happen or try and kill them quickly before they get those viper strikes off. Thankfully we have tons of damage right now and that's not much of a problem. Another champion pack here means another dead end. When it, that'll mean the last room, uh, the last corner is where we need to go. We have encountered a rogue exile here or a green gate. She will do a, uh, a rain of arrows skill that will pin you to the location, but she's not particularly dangerous. We can kill her for a good chunk of loot. Again, rogue exiles drop one item of every type uh, for your character, so there's a good chance you can get some nice, nicely useful items there. So we can check out things like the brigadine and the uh, boots and try and see what's useful for us. In general, for leveling, uh, this is a question I get a lot is uh, what should I be picking up right what should I be picking up and identifying and it's not a bad idea when you first start in the game le learning the game to pick up and identify many things right you, that's how you learn a lot of the gear by looking at uh, lots of different stats on items and comparing them and working out what's good and what's not now uh, however if you're trying to make things a little more lean and efficient then it's not a bad idea to uh, only pick up items that are potentially useful for you. You notice I dropped a bow earlier and you know this is a quiver, I can take this and sell this for alteration shards if I'm about to go to town, but maybe I can just save the time and continue progressing and just focus on gear that's potentially useful for me. So I'm thinking that, hmm, some, I, I wouldn't mind a new pair of gloves, so I'm gonna pick up and look at gloves. Uh, you know, chest armor, armor evasion chest armors are gonna be good for me. Boots are pretty much always gonna be good if they roll some move speed and things like that. So I'm gonna be identifying those things that could potentially be quite good for me, like this chest armor here is actually quite nice. It's actually an improvement over our current one with good life and resistance rolls. It's a very nice one, so we'll probably go ahead and use that. 
And then uh, just checking out some of these other ones that can potentially be used for, for us. Jewelry is often quite useful, so we can identify that. Uh, compared to our Raku Tiki for now, which has life and fire resist, that one's going to be okay. But we're going to definitely swap out this uh, chest armor here. You can hold alt if you would like to compare them uh, side by side like that. You can see the equipped one on the left and the one you're currently examining just above the item itself. So let's swap that back in and we got ourselves a nice little chunk of extra life and resistances. Gem Cutter's locks boxes give skill gems. Um, there's a few things you can get on here. Uh, support gems, only contain support gems, is a very nice affix to get. So if it doesn't really have anything on it, um, either quantity or additional items or support gems or contains an extra vile gem, something like that, then you could you could chuck an augmentation on there or an alteration. We got quantity of contained gems. This means this thing's gonna drop quite a few gems. So we'll go ahead and open that. Watch out for those lightning arrows on those uh, skeletons there. If you're standing near a wall, those can be a fair bit more dangerous. And we get ourselves a lot of skill gems here. And uh, some of these uh, are not ones that I can actually buy from vendors myself, like added cold, for example. So if I happen to get a, uh, a spare, you know, green slot, I can I can equip that in and get a little bit of bonus cold damage. So I'll level one of those up there. Not uh, potentially, potentially useful, essentially. Uh, nothing else too useful for me, though. And here we go, once we discover the orange staircase on the map, we can head on down into the Chamber of Sins level 2. Things get a lot more lightning damage in here. In that last zone, we only really had lightning arrows. There is a waypoint we can click right here to uh, sort of save our progress. Now, all of these guys will deal added lightning damage. The uh, skeleton guys, you can see the little sparkles on them. These guys will deal additional lightning damage. The necromancers in the zone will curse you with conductivity, which causes you to take more lightning damage and have a greater chance to be shocked, which causes you to take more damage again. So this is why you need that good lightning resist, right? Lightning resist will uh, help mitigate the potential of shock and it will help reduce that damage you take. Uh, white lockboxes like this at this level, I don't really think it's worth spending those transmutes on. We don't have a lot of transmutations, so uh, it's not a bad idea to just save those and just activate these, essentially just for a boost of mobs to kill. You can see these spark skeletal uh, mages there shooting their sparks out. Uh, they aren't particularly dangerous, uh, you know, just a couple sparks floating around, but once a room starts to fill up with them, that's when it starts to get dangerous. I noticed that I have three greater life flasks, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, upgrade those. Remember to uh, always check whether your flasks are up to date, as up to date as possible. We're level 20, so 18 level uh, 18 grand life flasks can be much nicer for us. If you have a good stash of transmutations, it's not a bad idea from 18 onwards, I think, to start transmuting those flasks as well. So I can chuck a transmutation on there. I have, you know, I have four. It should be enough for now. And uh, this provides immunity to shock when I use this, which is going to be very nice for the uh, zone that we're in right now. If you can get something like like a seething or a bubbling which heals you instantly when you use it it gives a sort of a burst of healing uh, that can be particularly powerful as well this zone's a little maze like there's a bunch of different directions you can go keep an eye out on these maps for these little bridges because you will be able to cross those and find new locations i'm going to pick up continue picking up those stem stone hammers to save for later those are used for a uh, vendor recipe later on picking up those chromatic items as well and uh, essentially what you're doing for you're doing in this zone is looking for a, like a long hallway. It looks a bit like an exit that's a long hallway, so I'll point that out when we get there. Here's a uh, particularly nasty lightning shrine, but I'm going to go in and sweep those guys down with no problems and claim it for myself. Shocking! I had to. Sorry guys, I had to. <laughs> Keep an eye out for any, like, well-rolled uh, resistance rings. There's a 28 ruby ring. We're going to head into some zones later with a bit of fire damage. That can be handy to uh, substitute our lightning resistant rings out that we have now uh, for a little bit later on to uh, give us more appropriate resistances for what we're going to be doing. So here's the exit I'm talking about here. Once you get a little closer, you can see that it's kind of, like, much longer. It doesn't go straight into another room. It's the only kind of section like this that has a long hallway before you actually get into the new room. And it's always going to bend up in this direction on the be this cage. We're going to go on the left side of the cage. Piety will uh, shout at us a little bit there. And now we're going to go fight the unique boss of this zone, who's a bit of a nasty fellow. He hits exceptionally hard and deals a lot of lighting damage. You can see the NPCs hyping him up as we move in. And he is... Fidelitas, the Abomination. Look at this guy. This guy is like some sort of giant uh, 
artificial creation, a human crossed with some sort of skeleton that puts out lightning damage. He uses the lightning strike skill and you can see, even with me being as tough as I am at the moment, he deals a large amount of damage when he hits me and that's with all my lightning resistance. If I take off my lightning resistance here, I'm going to take an even larger chunk of damage. He does 50-50 physical, 50 uh, uh, physical, 50 lightning, so uh, quite a large amount of damage there. We're going to chuck our lightning resist back on. I'm going to use our single target. So you can, if you're a ranged character, you can just try and keep your distance. It's not a bad idea with this guy to chuck down your decoy totem on the other side of him. It's important because when he hits with his lightning strike, it sends out a bunch of projectiles along the ground. And if you put them on, if you put it on this side of you, he'll attack the uh, decoy totem and you'll still get hit. So it's a good idea to put your decoy totem on the other side of him to take him out. And then essentially that's going to distract him while you just whack him in the back and finish him off. Once you've killed Fidelitas, we can activate the strange device here and obtain the Baleful Gem. From here, we're free to just portal back, or you can log out and log back in if you want to save the portal scroll, and that'll take you back to town. From here, we can talk to Groost and claim our quest reward. We have a couple of options here. Herald of Ash is very nice for a build like this. If you deal physical damage, this works a lot like the added fire support gem. Herald of Ash is a buff. It's something that you activate. It reserves a chunk of your mana, but it gives you a constant effect. Now, uh, because we deal primarily physical damage, this one is an ideal support gem, or it's an ideal skill gem for us, because it'll scale up our, uh, our physical damage by adding extra fire damage on top. And it also provides an additional ignite effect whenever you kill enemies as well, that uh, ignites other nearby enemies, which helps you kill large crowds, gives you a bit of extra area of effect. Um, so there's three different types of Heralds. There's Herald of Ice, Herald of Ash, and Herald of Thunder. Herald of Thunder and Herald of Ice provide flat amounts of damage. They don't scale based on physical, so these work well with both spellcasters and attack-based builds, you can see. It provides lightning damage to spells and to attacks. Herald of Thunder also creates a lightning storm around your character when you kill a shocked enemy, and Herald of Ice also creates like an explosion of ice whenever you kill an enemy as well. Now, because these reserve 25% mana each, it's actually quite possible to run multiple of them. And uh, if you're pretty good with your mana flask usage, you can even run three of them reserving total of your 75% uh, of your total mana and uh, still be able to uh, kill monsters quite freely if you use those mana flasks quite well. However, I think it's nice to go for about 50%. So I'm going to grab a Herald of Ash, but I also want to take a look at Enduring Cry here. This is a very strong defensive skill here. This is uh, a War Cry type skill, and uh, what happens when you activate this, your character shouts out, and uh, this regenerates some of your life for a very short duration, provides you a boost of healing, a bit like a flask, and then it also gives you some Endurance Charges, which make you more defensive uh, against uh, physical damage and also more resistant to different elemental types of damage as well. So it's a strong stacking buff and you can stack up three of those endurance charges by default. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take Enduring Cry because I can use that straight away. And then I'll just purchase the other one from Yina over here. Once you've completed that quest, her second page will open here and you'll be able to purchase any of the ones you miss in addition to a couple of other skills as well. So I'm also going to grab myself a Herald of Ash here for one Orb of Alteration, which we have plenty of those guys, and we'll equip that as soon as we have the intelligence to do so. Now the easiest way to get intelligence if you don't have any at this point is going to be to use an amulet. There's amulets like Lapis amulets which give straight up intelligence and there's also hybrid amulets now like this one that gives dexterity and intelligence for example. Now we do have our Araku Tiki which is giving us some life and fire resistance so it's a bit of a shame to trade that off so we can maybe keep an eye out for some other intelligence elsewhere but then again running that Herald of Ash is going to be a nice damage boost as well so it might well be worth it. I think I'm going to get one of these turquoise amulets here, and I'll go ahead and equip that so I can run Herald of Ash. And then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to keep my Araku Tiki aside, because if I get some intelligence on other gear, then I can re-equip that. This won't be too useful for much longer. It's not a super powerful unique, but it's quite nice early on in the game at the point that we, where we found it. I'll go ahead and equip that turquoise amulet now so I can equip that Herald of Ash. We can also chuck a transmutation on there to give it a few stats as well. Got a little bit of cold damage, nothing major. Now in order to actually equip these, I'm going to need some more red sockets on gear, so I'm going to be keeping in the back of my mind, keeping an eye out for any uh, pieces of gear, especially uh, helmets or uh, gloves, I can totally replace these with something that has some red sockets on it, so I can equip these new skills. For now though, I'm going to drop Decoy Totem, I don't really need the extra survivability for Herald of Ash, which is going to make us clear a little bit faster. 
So once we've cleared Chamber of Sins, we can go to the Riverways Waypoint here. Now we're going to be encountering some fire damage, so it's not a bad idea at this point to potentially swap out uh, that Lightning Resistance Ring that you probably have equipped from Chamber of Sins for that Fire Resistance Ring. And again, if we have any spare transmutations, we can go ahead and uh, craft this. I don't really have many transmutes at the moment, so I'm actually going to hold off. Uh, this White Items gives me 28 Fire Resist is going to be fine for now, and I'll keep an eye out and see if any other ones drop, because who knows, like, in the next zone, a Magical or a Rare Ruby Ring might drop or another ring might drop that I can use instead. So once we have that equipped, I'm going to go to the Riverways here, and then we're going to head west from here. Now once you actually get in a zone, you can activate your Herald of Ash by using its associated hotkey. So let's say if I have it on 4, I can press 4 here and it'll activate it. And uh, you'll see that it reserves a chunk of that mana and it gives me some fiery hands, which will also add damage to my attacks as well. Now a bit of a trick if you have a bunch of different skills equipped and uh, once you've activated Herald of Ash, you don't actually need it on your toolbar. You can go ahead and get rid of it. I can go ahead and put other, other skills here on all these other ones if I want. And my Herald of Ash will remain active. You can see it's up here in the buff. And you can turn it off again if you want to, you can either just remove it from the gem slot, or you can just activate it again to actually turn it off. Taking some shortcuts across the rivers, we'll go ahead and just head west along this road until we reach the entrance to the Western Forest. Western Forest is mostly populated by bandits. There are a couple of bandits that shoot poison arrow here, and then there's these fellas, the Martyrs of Alira. And uh, these guys look a little aggressive and a little strange, and that's because once they actually catch up with you, they'll go ahead and explode themselves. Now they deal primarily fire damage with that explosion, so that's why we want to get that ruby ring equipped and make sure we have good fire resistance. At 56 fire uh, resistance, I'm not taking too much damage from them, but if you go in here with like 10% or less fire resistance, then uh, a couple of those guys catching up to you and exploding on you will, will kill you in a real hurry for sure. Now you can kill those guys just before they explode as well if you're using ranged attacks, it's nice and easy. But uh, even as a melee attacker, it's not too hard to sort of just attack them before they get a chance. So you notice there's a bit of a delay before they actually activate and explode themselves and you can kill them before that happens. If they do explode, you don't get experience as well, so try and kill them before they explode. Now there's, at about the middle point of this road, uh, there'll be a waypoint here. And this is a good kind of like marker for the directions we want to travel. On one side of the road will be this spider webbed area, which will lead us to the Weaver's Chambers, and on the other side of the road you'll eventually come across a crumbled section of road a little further down, which will lead to Alira's Bandit Camp. Before we go to either of those things though, I'm going to continue following down the road and get myself uh, a bit of a side quest to get an extra passive point. Here I'll kill some of these exploding martyrs for you before they get a chance to explode. You can see me igniting enemies now, and that's thanks to the uh, Ignite Overkill effect of Herald of Ash. So eventually you'll reach a camp and a bit of an encampment, a bit of uh, a palisade fort uh, at the end of the road here and uh, Quest will pop up, kill the black guards and you'll meet Captain Artery. Um, he's got a lot of heart. <laughs> so we can take this guy out, he's, he's not too dangerous, he uses double strike which is a bit of single target damage and a cleave skill which I don't really think is very dangerous whatsoever. Once you kill him, he'll drop the Thaumatic Emblem just here. We'll kill through a few of his guards. You notice how I drew him out before I encounter his guards? If you just like YOLO charge in through here, you'll attract the attention of him and his guards. But if you kind of just hang at the entrance for a sec, he'll, like, he'll usually notice you before his guards do, and he'll run out. You can fight him just by himself, which makes life a little easier. So once you've taken out the guards and uh, Captain Artery himself, you can drop the Thormatic Emblem here in the seal just by clicking on the seal. And this will actually drop the spikes here that uh, Piety earlier summoned to block our way. And you'll notice we now have a shortcut back to Act 1. This doesn't really serve any practical purpose beyond what I'm doing right now. If you cross over into this zone and take a portal scroll back here, it's actually a bit faster than like portaling back to town and then changing towns, you'll end up in Act 1. And uh, this is imp important because once we do that quest, we can go talk to Bestel here in town. And he'll actually give us an extra passive uh, point here, a book of skill, which we can apply. Since I also got a level, and I get two points to apply just there. Warrior's Blood is a very nice life regeneration, 1.8% life regeneration. In addition to a bit of strength, it means that we're going to have a lot of regeneration of our life now. What are we up to? 11.6 life per second already, which is quite high. So from there we can just take the waypoint back into, uh, we can actually just go straight back to the western forest from there, that'll take us to the waypoint, back to where I uh, pointed out the uh, the spiderweb encrusted zone, and if you guys are arachnophobes, this is going to be a part of the game which is going to be a little unpleasant for you guys, unfortunately. 
but I believe in you guys. I believe you can tough it through it. Follow the web zone. Uh, see, I've kind of like gone on the outside there, but you can see whenever the kind of like the grass is webbed in on the map, it's quite evident that uh, this area here is full of web. So we can follow this through. Just head deeper and deeper into this web section. Uh, just making sure not to kind of like wander outside of it. And eventually you'll find uh, just in the deepest point here, uh, an entrance to the Weaver's Chambers. It's a bit creepy. <laughs> the zone will give you the heebie-jeebies for sure. Look at this place. It is, it is nasty, man. And uh, look at like the bugs and everything. Do yourself a favor and zoom in in this zone and just kind of like pay attention to the floor. It's practically alive. And uh, there's a lot of kind of like gruesome details like that in Path of Exile. And notice this wiggles every now and that's actually a guy. <laughs> He is uh, actually encased and webbed, but uh, not much we can do for him, except uh, we'll we'll get some revenge for you, bro. We'll get some revenge for you. So in this zone here, it's nearly always down towards the left if you can go that way. Sometimes it'll be blocked off, but as for which direction to head, typically down towards the left is going to be the most correct path. Now there's two types of spiders in here. There are some that use Flicker Strike, which uh, teleport to you, dealing a, a chunk of physical damage. And then there's Viper Strike ones, which are much like that unique boss we fought earlier. So uh, just watch out for stacking too many stacking up Viper Strikes, and uh, you know try and take the spiders out as you as you go without uh, attracting the attention of too many at once, and you're going to be fine. So following the outside path, there was a bit of a dead end room there, but we should be able to continue just kind of like following the outermost path and we should be, we should be just fine. I'm going to try and, uh, push this blasphemer. Oh, here we go. There's a rare mob right there. Hopefully we can get her to jump right into that rare mob. In you go, in you go. And we get ourselves some extra loot. There you go. Some tormented spirit action and uh, a good chunk of rares and a glass well as bauble too, which are used to, uh, give quality to floss. That's something we want to save for much later in the game when we have some powerful floss that we want to improve. So eventually you'll come to a door here, the Weaver's Nest, which will teleport you into the boss room. This is uh, one of the harder bosses in this act, considering it's not like a, a major end of act boss. It's kind of like a mini boss, but uh, but one that can be particularly nasty. Prepare for a lot of uh, physical damage, prepare for a lot of chaos damage, and prepare for a massive continuous stream of spiders. And uh, say hello, ladies and gentlemen, to the Weaver. Now the Weaver is a massive spider that we use the Ethereal Knife skill. You can see her spitting those uh, green spines at me. It's a version of the player skill Ethereal Knives. And uh, she'll spit those out and those deal part chaos and part physical damage. Now with her will also be a pack of champion spiders. So we want to try and take those out first and make life a little bit easier. But constantly throughout this fight she'll harass you by spitting Ethereal Knives at you. Uh, attacking with melee attacks and also summoning just a constant barrage of spiders. And when you kill the spiders in this zone they also their corpse explode into additional baby spiders. Now once you get her to half-life, we, like we just did just there, uh, she'll disappear, she'll fly up to the roof for a while, and a bunch of other spiders will appear down. It's pretty easy in normal difficulty, not too many spiders to deal with, and she doesn't deal quite as much damage, but in later difficulty she's going to be very, very nasty. So sort of learn the mechanics of this fight and try and uh, try and get a little confident with dodging those ethereal knives attacks. You notice I'm sort of side strafing and using my AoE abilities to both kill the additional spiders and deal damage to her at the same time. That is the best tactic against this boss. This this uh, boss can become a bit of a DPS check as well, so you need to make sure your your weapon is up to spec, that you're dealing enough damage to take out those additional spiders quickly while downing her. The faster you can do this fight, the easier it's going to be. Once you're killing, you get Malagara's Spike, and we can head back to town and turn this in for another quest reward. We'll talk to Silk just here, and we get a choice of three different support gems, and all of these are quite good. The first one, melee physical damage, is an obvious choice for us. It gives a more multiplier to melee physical damage. Now, more multipliers apply after your other increases to physical damage. So, let's say you have on the uh, passive skill tree uh, passives like this fellow here, 25% increased physical damage. Well, that say you deal 100 points of damage will take, make you deal 125 points of damage. That uh, more physical damage will then multiply that 125 rather than your base 100. So it can be very powerful, especially once you have a lot of passive scaling or damage. So this is a very powerful support. 
Also of quite uh, import is uh, faster attacks, which causes you to attack much faster. It's pretty self-evident by the title. Uh, this obviously increases your damage per second as well by making you attack faster, putting out your damage more quickly. But uh, at the same time, it also has some defensive properties by making your attacks happen quick more quickly. It means that you can be a little more mobile, you can dodge attacks a little more, you're locked into your animations for a shorter period of time. So also a very good choice. Weapon elemental damage can be very powerful, but it depends on how much elemental damage scaling you have. If you're using like a build that's primarily stacking elemental damage and not really worrying about physical damage, then this is going to be the best support gem for you. And if you're using things like added fire already, and maybe you're using a skill that has a conversion, so you're using something, for example, that deals 50% physical, 50% cold damage, then weapon elemental damage would be very good, especially if you're also using some heralds on top. The more elemental damage you have, the more attractive this is going to be. Our best choice at this point is probably going to be melee physical damage, but faster attacks is also a solid choice. Take whichever you can use straight away. Like if you have a green socket open that you can link into your main skill, then take faster attacks. And if you have uh, a red socket open, take melee physical damage. I'll take melee physical damage for now, but we're going to be looking out for more uh, better linked gear because we're we're a little we're struggling a little bit on the uh, the gear sockets front front at the wow. moment. It's often around this point in Path of Exile where you'll start having a little more trouble with gear. What usually becomes the most troublesome thing at this point is going to be those gear sockets. You start getting a lot more skills, you start getting a lot more options and support gems, and that'll increase as you progress. And it can become difficult to balance having good gear, gear with life and resistances, like for example this, with gear that has good sockets as well, like something with uh, four linked sockets. Now, uh, that's these struggles in Path of Exile, these tougher moments where you're like, you feel like, oh man, how am I going to make this work? Where am I going to get this gear together to make this actually work? I'm getting stuck because I just need some more slot, uh, my, more more gem slots, but uh, or I need some more resistances, but I just can't get it without sacrificing some of my support gems. Uh, Path of Exile is a game of bootstrapping it. Sometimes you just have to do what's going to work to get you through the next zone, even if that means swapping out a couple pieces of gear, using a subpar piece of gear that has better sockets, or sacrificing some support gems in order to get those resistances you need for that very next zone. It's these struggle moments in Path of Exile that define players, and uh, if you find yourself overcoming those and enjoying that process of having to overcome those, then you're going to enjoy Path of Exile a lot more in the long run. So, uh, although you can have these struggle moments, try not to get too disheartened, guys, because they can be, uh, once you do overcome them, it's a very satisfying experience and that is a, a large part of the uh, kind of like the difficulty curve of Path of Exile is uh, thinking how you can bootstrap something together, how you can make something work. So on that particular topic, it's a good idea every time you level up, if you're struggling for gear, especially for sockets, to check vendors every level. Every time you level up, vendors refresh and lo and behold, just here, three red link plated gauntlets. Now I currently have a unique here, and this is actually an important lesson for Path of Exile as well. Don't get too focused on uniques and rares, right? Um, something that is shiny can be very hard to give up, especially if you're a newer player. But uh, you have to think about what's actually important to my character at the moment. In terms of uh, my character at the moment, I'm looking for physical damage, life and resistances. What does this have on it? Not really much. It has a little bit of accuracy. I have resolute technique, that doesn't matter. A little bit of lightning damage. I don't really do anything to make that lightning damage hit any harder. 1 to 13 damage at this point isn't a lot. I deal 400 DPS or more, so uh, I can sacrifice that without it losing any damage. And then the other two effects of this are kind of like fluff stats, right? These aren't really helping me. Increase attack speed on full life, most of the time I'm taking damage. Increase movement speed on low life, most of the time I have full life, so... These pair of gloves are actually pretty rubbish for me at the moment. Like, they were nice when I first found them because they had a bit of extra bonus damage. But at this point, you know, just because it's unique doesn't make it good. So I'm going to go for these white gloves here are going to be more useful to me because they have good sockets. So I'm going to go ahead and purchase those and I can even chuck a transmutation on them. Maybe get some life and resistances. If I'm particularly struggling for resist, I could spend a couple of alterations here trying to get something nice. I chucked an alteration on, got 8% attack speed. That's more, much more useful to me than these Ondar's class were. And guess what? Now I have a chance to three link these guys up. Which is going to give me, I, I can put on, uh, I can put on life gain on hit on my single target here. I can keep life gain on hit on there. Or I can put melee physical damage on my uh, single target now. I have a bunch more options. And I just freed up two support gem slots for my Enduring Cryer skill and my Decoy Totem. So now I have a lot more going on for my character, which is very nice. So just because this was unique doesn't make it good. And by trading it out for just a blue item or even a white item, I was able to progress my character a lot more.
Alrighty guys, that's going to be it for this chapter of the Path of Exile Survival Guide. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it and found it informative. In the next episode, we're going to be learning how to take on the bandits and which bandit you should take for your build. Now guys, I'd like to apologize for those of you guys who have been following along for the long delay between episodes. I'm going to try and get these Survivor Guide episodes done whenever I, whenever I can. I have a good time doing them, just my time management is something that currently eludes me. And it's something I'm going to be working on improving. Anyway guys, that's it for now. I'm Ziggy D, and thanks for watching.